So let me begin with some of the questions we received earlier. So this question is to Pastor. How do you lead with empathy and yet balance the demands and pressures as a leader? All right. Um, so how do you lead with empathy and still balance the pressures? Um, oh, so, I mean, uh, the first thing, of course, is uh, there is normal human reaction. That is, you do get upset. Okay, so I do get upset. <laughs> it's not like we don't get upset or we don't get irritated or aggravated. Uh, uh, there are those emotions at play uh, when when things go wrong or people you know fail to do what they, you're expecting them to do or you know this the usual things that happen as as a leader and you're leading people. Uh, so the emotions are real. It's not that we don't feel those. But that's when we, one is really to depend on the Spirit of God to give us that love and that compassion and that different perspective, right? So as a leader, the key is for us to stay in the Spirit throughout the day. So while you're going about all our day-to-day -day activities, planning, scheduling, all the normal things that we have to do, uh, the thing is to stay in the Spirit. So you, you're living or walking with the Holy Spirit, something happens that can trigger those emotions, that's when we have to bring our own emotions in subjection to the Holy Spirit. And so Holy Spirit, help me move in love, help me move with compassion in this given situation. Uh, help me to understand things from that person's perspective. So uh, when we're able to see things, you know, why did that person not do what they were supposed to do? Why did the person make a wrong choice or a wrong decision? Uh, why did they overspend or whatever, you know, whatever that failure is? Uh, help, help me to see it from their perspective. Help me to see uh, what, what happened. So that's when, you know, our dependence on the Holy Spirit and, and, and empower us to move in compassion. Now, I have lost it many, uh, several times. Uh, our staff can tell you about that. Uh, you know, there are times when I've, I have lost it. Uh, when I have told people straight in the face, hey, this is not the way it's supposed to be done, you know, and I, I didn't mince my words. I had, I was direct, sometimes bordering on being rude, and this is coming from the pastor, you know. <laughs> but, so I can tell you, the emotions are real. It's not, you can't pretend it's not there. But our goal is to walk in submission to the Holy Spirit. He empowers us to move in love, move in compassion, see things from their perspective, give us the wisdom and how to resolve the problem. And that's kind of what I would share, you know, in, in those situations. If you want to add some things, please feel free. Good question. Okay, so then is anyone sharing? No, just to add to what Pastor said, I think one of the things what I always see is that, you know, to put yourself in the other person's shoe uh, and also not to be judgmental at times, right? So I think... It's easy to say, but then at that heat of the moment, you know, maybe we are immediately, uh, uh, you know, reacting to a situation. But I think the main thing is that, you know, like everybody said in the in the, in all the sessions, you know, how can you really exhibit that gentleness? How can you really be, you know, kind to the other person and so on? You know, and then when we ask God for that compassion, you know, to be put into our hearts, I think empathy gets developed you know, over a period of time. So just want to add to what Pastor said. So quite, often, quite often, empathy and compassion is a choice. It doesn't come naturally. Yeah. So this question is for you, Mr. Abraham. What are the steps to, that we can follow to remain and to be a positive influence? To remain and to be a positive influence. Remain slash be. So I've... Yeah, to remain and to be, you know, this verse uh, which I am reminded of to answer this question is in Psalm 51.10. You have the psalmist praying to God by saying, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. The word steadfast there, actually to remain and to be. So to be steadfast in God's presence is when we become a victim of circumstances or victim of the result of things around us, which is probably done by other people then we change based on the circumstance or the influence that it has upon us. But the psalmist, when he prays, you know, this, this is one verse that we've all read and we, we even have this chorus that we sing, create in me a clean heart of God. But the meaning behind it is, I mean, God can only create something that doesn't exist. 
So when you say, God, create in me a clean heart, the prayer and the supplication is, I don't have a clean heart, God. Create one in me. You know, that's the real depth of that word. To, to remain and to sustain in spite of circumstances is asking God, the creator, to create in us an attitude or a character which I don't possess or I don't have by default. So I think to answer that question in one line, it would be submitting before God to say, Father, you please be in control. Just as pastor said a little while ago, we all have our emotional moments. Probably pastor just said, you ask my staff, they'll tell you, you come to the plantation and ask who Saji Abraham is, they'll tell you how hard he can be. Because one thing we need to understand beyond all that is, you're at the end of the day accountable to God before whom no compromise is possible. And when, he, when you're answerable to him, there are areas where you need to draw that line very clear. To, to sustain yourself, to remain and to maintain yourself before God's presence in a way that God would acknowledge is good takes a lot of grace of God in your life. And you've got to ask God's favor to say, Father, renew a steadfast spirit in me that I can be unwavering irrespective of what the circumstance might be. And that, I think, is the best way forward. And I've learned it the hard way because I'm also a person who was moved by emotions, swayed by results and things like that. But the Lord taught me, sit down, you don't know much. And each time the Lord taught me, you know, today there is a level of maturity which the Lord has given us with which you never jump in ecstasy, neither do you cry in depression. But you stand before God and say, thank you, Lord. My only aim in life is like Peter to sleep if there are chains in my hands. If I can grow to that level, that will be the best. So I think we need to ask God in prayer to give us the grace to be steadfast. And that's the best way to go forward in that. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Ratna, I'm going to address this question to you. When does one decide to leave their current job? If we don't feel satisfied in my current role, when should I look out? Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay it's a difficult question, but uh, uh, you know, just to uh, say some perspective, you know, others can also add. I think, you know, when we look at a job, right? I think. If you ask me, you know, I think a couple of aspects play a role when you have to change the job. So one is that, um, are you satisfied with what you're doing, right? I mean, like a lot of us talked about, you know, what we need to be at workplace and so on. So satisfaction is very, very personal thing, right? I mean, we can't just be pressurized because everybody else is changing the job, so I should change. But are you having anything with, you know, with, with respect to your satisfaction? The second thing is also that, are you learning, you know, and then are you also able to fulfill, let's say, your own, you know, let's say like, you know, like all of us might have a personal vision, mission for our own lives. And is the current job helping me, you know, to achieve my personal vision? So it could be a spiritual vision, you know, you, know, you have a goal for God, you want to do something. And is the job helping you to go in the direction or is the job blocking you from moving in the direction, right? So, so there are several aspects like that. And also there may be, you know, a situation that you may have to compromise on your values, compromise, maybe, you know, you're taking too much of your time, and then, you know, you really want to change into something where you, you know, you want to focus on, let's say, other things, other priorities in your life, you know, rather than focusing only on the job. So, so like that, you can go on listing, but what I would really say is that it's a very, very individualistic thing, you know, because each one has a different uh, preference, different interest. So just to, uh, you, you know, say, so that's when one decides to change a job. Pastor, you want to add something? <laughs> okay, so we have a, a couple of questions that I'm going to quickly club together. So this one is for you, Pastor. So as said by Pastor Ashish, we need to go beyond the call of duty, but where do we draw the line? Because people tend to take advantage or take us for granted. I'm just going to add more. Um, again, same question it was for Pastor Ashish and Ratna. Uh, you all mentioned showing love, but in the corporate world, that can be taken uh, as weakness or people take advantage of it. How does one draw lines as a believer? Um, yeah, so going beyond the call of duty, um, I think we just have to, you know, 
think about it in, in, in practical ways and practical, uh, I guess, you know, you can have s numerous uh, s scenarios and situations. Uh, we want to do that without destroying other things in your life. Obviously, for example, uh, you know, th there's a balance between the time you give to work to, uh, as well as to your family and other things that you're pursuing. So when we say go beyond the call of duty, obviously it's held in balance with other things. But it's okay uh, to keep checks and balances over a period of a week or over a period of two weeks, or you know, short, short, keep short accounts so that you have checks and balances where if you need to do certain things over time that takes away a lot of your time to finish something at work, you do have the checks and balances you know, to bring back order uh, and balance things out in the other areas. You know, so for example, you know, let's say you're, you're part of a team, uh, you've got to deliver you know, the next, within the next two weeks, so you, you have a delivery coming, you're working on this project, uh, uh, you're pushing with the team. Uh, so you're going to go beyond the call of duty. Okay, you know, yeah, you're expected to work so many hours or do so much, but then you know the delivery is there and so you're giving your best. So those last two weeks is going to be intense and it's going to take away maybe time from your family or from other things that you may have. It's okay. You are doing it. You're going to deliver it. You're committed to that project. It's, you know, and especially if you're in a leadership position, you doing that is going to motivate the rest of the team, but you being absent will probably be a demotivator for the rest of the team. So that two weeks requires you to be there and it requires you to push. And you may have, you know, instead of your eight to 10 hour days, you may have 12 to 14 hour days, but it's that short period, window of time. Now, once that is done, then you, you know, of course, you take time to, you know, bring other things back to normalcy. So, so what, what, what am I saying is we have to push beyond call of duty when, when duty requires but then the net is you're keeping things in balance and that's some, you keep short accounts to do that. You keep things you know, in order. I'll just say one thing about showing love and then I'll let Ratna speak, but you know, uh, love is genuine. You, you, you show genuine care and concern for people in ways that you can express uh, in the workplace. Uh, but love, does, love is not compromising. Like, you know, we, we talked about mercy and truth, or grace and truth. You're balancing both. Love, does, love doesn't compromise on truth. Love doesn't compromise on what needs to be done. You are loving. Uh, you're kind and so on. But then at the same time, you're not compromising on what needs to be done. So that has to be held in balance uh, in the workplace. And, you know, so people know you care, but you're not compromising on the quality of work or things that need to be done. Right? I don't know. Yeah, I think, you know, it's absolutely true what Pastor said. And, uh, you know, we can't compromise at times. But I think when we look at love at workplace, uh, one thing I see is that many a times, you know, the, you know, like the Bible says, the goodness of the Lord, you know, leads us to repentance. So when you keep showing love, when you keep sowing love, you know, into other people's life, in many a times, you know, you also see a change. You know, I mean, there are people who may take you for a ride. They may, there are people who may take advantage of it. But still, you know, many a times you will see a positive impact. And also, if you combine it with praying for those people, right? I mean, it, like when it comes to work, I mean, we may pray for some people, but they're not really, you know, if somebody is taking us for granted, do we really pray for them? And if you do that diligently, and I'm sure God will actually, you know, uh, provide a way out. And, uh, you know, Bible talks a lot about agape love, unconditional love. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, right? So we can, the, the only standard we can apply when it comes to love is, you know, what love Jesus showed each one of us. Yeah, and I think I should I add, uh, add, now I remember Ratna sharing at Life Group once that, you know, when you're having a difficult time, say a prayer saying, Lord, whatever you bless me, that same blessing 10 times more for the other. So that's a difficult one, but you talked about how you practice that, and that was another lesson that we could add to this. Um, I'm going to ask questions. I mean, there's a mic that's available if anyone wants to ask questions on the spot. While you get ready for that, I'm going to address one more question here. Uh, Mr. Abraham, we are called to be fishers of men. How can we do that? Some practical ways or tips in the corporate secular world on how to be a fisher of man. And I, I'm going to just add another question. 
Why do we find just a few true Christians as top leaders or heads of organizations or in the government? That's a nice question, the second one. The, the, the first one is, I mean, uh, basically, how do we be fishers of men in the place of work? For, for example, like, I mean, my career has gone through various uh, areas. I mean, I've worked in the retail, I've worked on plantations, I've worked on corporate responsibilities. I, right now I work on a Europe-based company which is into the production of food or food products which we export, something called tempeh that's exported the world over, which Subway and McDonald's and all these people, IKEA furniture restaurant serves our products. So this is the kind of areas that I work in. So when you look at this diversified platforms through which you will actually be able to, uh, you know, show them the love of Christ, just as Pastor Noel was saying. It's, it's very difficult sometimes in such workplaces. But then how do you balance that change? And how do you be fishers of men? The only thing is your situation handling skills and how you manage, you know, situations under pressure where somebody else is affected, where you can be a little selfless in those situations adds more value to who you are. That's what I've seen in my life. Never look at what you might gain out of it. Always look at what you can provide for someone else who's affected. And if you can be that kind of a person, people will come to you and ask you. I'll quote an example why. See, in the, in the, in the Brook Bond, on Hindustan Leavers, when I was there, there was this union leader who was very notorious. And nobody would recognize him because he was a leader. He had influence, he had political backing. So everybody was a little careful about him. But he was a troublemaker and he used to go on making trouble for everybody there and he tried the same with me. Now, as a Christian, I cannot retaliate like everybody else would. So what I did one day is my only strategy to do with him was he was usually working with many other people, but I had this option to single him out and put him in a different place, sit there alone and do your work. And the whole purpose of making him sit alone was so that I could go and talk to him and none else would listen. So one day I made him sit alone, I went there and I was speaking to him, and as I was speaking to him, you know, he was very arrogant, very rough, and, and his, by nature he's like that. So I spent about half an hour talking to him. This man totally sobered down, and he said, Sir, none of the directors of this company have ever come and spoken to me this way. You know what he thought? He thought, I made him sit alone so that I could speak to him. It wasn't that way. I actually wanted him alone so that he dis doesn't disturb the others. But the perception he had was, this sir wanted to talk to me, so he made me sit alone and he's giving me importance. And he made sure that everybody else noticed that I was speaking to him. Okay, so he felt very important. And I told him, you're very important to me. You're the person that the company needs. But then why are you behaving this way? He said, sir, nobody's even recognized me. Everybody thinks I'm a wrong person with a wrong attitude. I said, that doesn't matter, but I think that you're great. I think you're nice. I think you're a person who can contribute. You know, he started weeping in the office. And then I said, hey, man, if you start crying like this, they'll think I'm a bigger rowdy than you. <laughs> so don't cry. So I gave my kerchief to wipe his tears away, and he felt touched. And then, you know, in the evening when I was driving back to my bungalow there, he stands on the road. And people have already warned me, sir, if you find this man alone, don't stop your vehicle because he will kick you. He's very arrogant and he's already done this with people before. He's got enough of police cases. So rightfully, just below my bungalow, I take the turn where nobody can see and he's there in the middle of the road just waving out to stop. I said, Lord Jesus, I need your protection now. You know, with a prayer, I got down from my GP. He said, can you come down and I'd like to speak to you. I said, I spoke to you in the office. No, 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 I want to speak something. You know, he came and fell on my feet and said, would you forgive me for the way that I am? And he said, you spoke to me about the Lord Jesus this morning. Will that God forgive me, sir? And you know, then I was able to share with him about the love of God. And I said, God will forgive you. He said, will you pray for me? I prayed for him. Today, let me tell you, that rowdy is the worship leader in that church there. That's the workplace change of how you can win souls for Christ, how you can be fishers of men. We need to come down. We need to make other people feel important, which others don't do. Now, just the second question that she just asked is, why don't we find many Christians in the top positions in government or many other places? One of the reasons is we Christians are pretty shy about penetrating the workplace. We think, oh, we are holy. I mean, we don't fit there. I mean, I'm holy, holy, holy. We got to stop thinking that way. I mean, the, the, the disciples of Jesus was questioned, one question, why is your leader found among the sinners? He was found among the prostitutes, among the tax collectors, and Jesus said, I came for them. 
if a christian can have that attitude even now you will find christians in positions in the government in top positions today we don't find christians because of the fact that we christians have belittled ourselves to people who just want comfort and you know a comfortable living that god needs to give we call upon the lord jesus for the sake of a comfortable living and blessings we are not here or ready to go that extra bit for the glory of god if you can find a christian who can do that you will find that happening in society today and i'm sure we can rise up to that to fill in that gap god is a calling upon each of us wherever we are let's do our best and let's pray together god will raise people this nation needs to know god and we need people in the top rungs of the ladder people who know god and that is an essential that's the role of the church and that's the role of every believer and we need to look at that happening in my organization let me tell you we have this factory in pune and in bangalore irrespective of which background they come from every morning it starts with devotion from the word and prayer it doesn't matter where you come from and today people just join in you know they come in and say i mean non believers they come and say aya can you please pray for this i have this problem you know over a period of time they know that there is a true god that you serve and to be fishers of men that way at your workplace is the greatest opportunity god has given you you don't have to preach the gospel you don't have to read your bible you just got to be the person that god wants you to be rest of it god will do you know i i believe in this corporate philosophy you don't become a leader by having followers around you like these politicians have you give 500 rupees and they'll follow you right that's what happens during elections and all that i mean people follow you because of something they get out of you but create followers that should be the way a christian should be you will create followers because of who you are because of christ in you there'll be followers when we see jesus in the bible i mean crowds were thronging him because they just wanted to touch him just to get healed and you and i are in an office in a workplace where jesus would impart the same healing through you and me to your colleagues around but we are unfit to do that they don't find anything different in us as a christian that's the reason why they don't follow us if we can portray jesus in us people will follow you you will be fishers of men and it is possible so that should be the motivation with which we as christians live you know god has given us the authority and the grace to take control of the workplace but we are actually suppressing ourselves and saying god give me the grace to survive through this don't be a beggar before god be somebody who can receive grace and pass it on that's the role of a christian you have the authority he said you're more than a conqueror through him who called you if you're more than a conqueror the your workplace you got to be a different person and that's what i saw right from the time i joined as an assistant manager in hindustan lever till today wherever i am i see the grace of god provided you are ready to take i mean you will get brick bats you will get kicked back you will feel lonely you'll sit and cry in your room but it's worth it and the lord can use us so let's all turn to be fishers of men it's a beautiful question yeah thank you very much yeah. thank you do we have any questions from the audience i do have a lot more here but yes hi uh Uh, i think uh, pastor shared uh, one point which said uh, to show uh, to show love without compromising your values uh, something along the same lines with uh, policies changing organizational values changing and evolving uh, along the same lines of inclusivity and other things how do you strike a balance of of choosing to say no to certain things to add more to that uh, i was one of the only person in my organizations who who kind of said no to something along the lines of lgbtq or inclusivity and uh, i had an escalation on me uh, and very recently another friend of mine uh, was given probably two or three warnings for not addressing people using pronouns and uh, with with things becoming so harsh uh, how do we strike a balance or how do we say put our foot down and say no uh keeping in mind our a calling in 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 workplaces uh pastor just a quick note that question actually has been asked a couple of times so it's obviously a question of concern and there's just one more point uh, about that how do you help this is with regard to in, uh, inclusivity and inclusion and diversity how do you help them see the truth not just the person but even others supporting them and i think what all of our just listened i mean that's come through several times over so this is a question thanks um <clears throat> we got to look at it uh, in two different contexts right one is if i'm working for an organization and another context would be if i own the business right 
See, if I own the business, and, and you've read about these cases in the US where, example, you know, there's, there's and this has happened on many occasions, uh, and, and the typical scenario is where uh, a person, you know, is running a bakery, they bake cakes and so on, and, a, you know, a gay couple comes in, they order a cake to be made for their wedding. And, and this has happened US times. He said, I can't do that. And the, I think the case went up, up all, all the way to the Supreme Court, you know. So that's a scenario where you own the business and you have a right on what you say in that business, right? Or what you want to do or not, what you want to do, what, what kind of, you know, whom you want to serve and so on. So that's the scenario. Another scenario is where you are working for an organization and where the policy of the organization is the policy, you know, created by numerous people globally and so on. And you're there to implement the policy for the organization, but it is not a question about your personal beliefs or our personal beliefs or our personal stand of faith. It is the organization has employed me to implement the policy. The policy itself is against my personal belief, but the organization didn't hire me for my personal belief. They hired me to do a job, right? So that's where, you know, either you stay in the organization and implement the policy of the organization, which means hire everybody as long as they are, you know, qualified. You know, uh, the, the, the individual can be gay, whatever their the, the preference is, sexual orientation or preference or however they disclosed it. That's their choice. The organization wants to hire such a kind of a person to do the work, you know, whatever that, you know, the, the work may be. And you're, you're in this organization, you have to implement the policy, hire the person, not because of their, you know, as long as they're going to be able to do the job, but then they also want to be affirmative towards those communities. And that's why they're doing that, right? So the affirmative action could be towards people of certain sexual orientation or could be towards certain demographics, whatever, and, and you know, different organizations have different policies. So if you're implementing a poli an affirmative action policy towards people of a certain demography, now they want to do it towards people of a certain sexual orientation. But they are hiring people who are qualified to do a work and you're now here to execute the policy. That Policy may be against your personal faith, but I don't think it is something, uh, it is a violation of our stand for God in implementing the policy. So I don't see that as wrong, right? Because you're implementing the policy. Yes, you don't personally, I mean, I, I don't personally agree with that person's, you know, self, sexual orientation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, whatever things they're doing. But I'm there implementing the policy of the organization. So, that's not the point. Uh, that's not the point to say I will not do this because of my faith. Because they didn't hire you because of your faith. They hired you because of your skill to do a certain work, right? So I, I think that see that is a wrong position to take. For example, this morning I, I read in, I read it. I forget which thing. There's a headmistress of a school refused to salute the Indian flag because she was a Christian. I was like, that's stupidity. Now it brings a bad name to Christians. Now that is not a stand of faith. That's a stand of stupidity. All right? Because, hey, you are in this nation. You're a citizen of this nation. And as a citizen of this nation, you're supposed to honor something, which is you're supposed to honor the flag and you're supposed to honor the national anthem. You're supposed to honor the constitution. You can't, we cannot say, I will not salute the flag because I'm a Christian. No. Right? But it brings a bad name to us. So, see, people are sometimes really stupid and they think it's a stand of faith. No, it's not a stand of faith. Right? So, sorry for using the word stupid. If you don't like it, replace it. <laughs> but the point I'm making is, the point I'm making is, you're not compromising your faith when you're implementing the policy of the organization because you're working for the organization. And I don't think uh, we should think that and now, at a personal level, I can talk to somebody in the organization and say, look, you know, this is where I stand in my personal faith. That is 
separate. That's outside of the context of the organization. I can talk to somebody. I can let them know where my faith is uh, on certain matters, where I stand on certain matters. But that's outside the context of you know the organization, what they want me to do. Now, if you're owning a business, that's where you are free to have your own policies, uh, which you want. You know, you may have, for example, as a church, if somebody applies, you know, sorry, you know, we will not hire, right? Or if to gay people come and say we want you to conduct a Christian marriage, sorry, we will not do it because of where we stand as a church. So that's something we have control over. Versus when you're working for an organization, you don't have control over, you're obliged to participate in the policy of the organization. So those are two different scenarios. And what was the second question? Was it for me or? Actually, it was the same thing. Tatnad, would you like to answer that? Because is, Jocelyn, is it answered, your question? Uh, yes, uh, probably just one thing. It could be a very simple thing of, of say, wearing a, a lanyard which has got the pride colors. Because wearing it could, could say that I support or I endorse what I, what's the organization implementing. Simple things like that. Because I don't want to wear something which says that I support and things like that. So I think in that case, you have, it is imposing on you as a person and you have the right to push back. Right? So that's again a different scenario where you have the right to push back if they're imposing it on you. You know, I say, hey, I don't want to wear the, I don't want to wear that rainbow tag, or I don't want to wear those colors, or I don't want to wear certain things because that's invading your personal space. You definitely have a right to push back, and they can't hold it against you. That's yeah, that's a different scenario. Okay. Ratna, a question for you. Could Ratna give us a bit more of insight into his journaling process? See, I think. Um, uh, I think Pastor also has talked about journaling uh, earlier in some of the books, uh, you know, what good it can do about writing something. So I think the, the important aspect of journaling is that, first of all, we have to build that habit. You know, it comes over a period of time. Uh, so what I always tell, you know, when someone says I want to write is that the first and foremost thing you can do is they do it in the nighttime before you sleep. At least make it a point to write. I mean, you need to first of all buy a notebook and a pen. Yeah, so that's important. <laughs> but uh, write three sentences, uh, you know, before you sleep. You know, just make it, okay, I will write three sentences every night before I sleep. It could be that, what did you learn today? What are you thankful to God for today? And what is something that you could have done better today? You know, and uh, keep that kind of, uh, you know, stuff and start writing. And eventually, when you start writing, let's say one month you have written three sentences. Now you, second month, you read all those, you know, you know, the 30 days, what you have written. Actually, you will start to understand or you will start to, you know, get a point of view that how is your life going, right? Where are you going? You know, it's also an exercise, you know, where you can retrospect, you know, what you are able to do, you know, what you are not able to do, where do you need help from God. And so on. So I think it's 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 very important to do it consistently. Uh, but you know, when you start to write, uh, it, it it always happens. And also, secondly, you know, one more thing I I I, I tell everybody, you know, is that there is this book about uh, how to build habits. You know, what what this author says is that you know you stack a habit into an existing habit. Yeah. So let's say morning, all of us maybe you you when you wake up, maybe you have your coffee or tea. Right, every day, wherever you are, you're traveling anywhere. You may have a coffee or tea, you know. But then you make a point that okay, I will anyway have a coffee or tea every day. I wake up, but before having the coffee or tea, I will write five. You know, I will take five minutes to write something. So which means that you can, you know, it's like a, you can get a coffee only if you write, right? So it's it's also in in an established habit. You can also stack something which also works, right? So I think that's what I wanted to say. But, and, and it has really worked because then, you know, you start to really write over a period of time. I mean, like, I, I also have the habit, if you read a book, then you write what you learn from the book, right? So it's only for your reference, you know, but you, you just write it and keep it, and then you can always go back and refer to it. And it really, really helps, you know? Thank you, Ratna. Any more questions from the audience? I still have more here, and we don't have much time. Yes. 
Uh, good evening. What I would like to ask is, I am promoted in my workplace and my colleagues are, even though I am correct, according to me, I am doing all according to the uh, office procedures and my officers are happy with me, in fact, to see, but my colleagues, uh, uh, you know, among whom I, I was promoted, they are not happy with me somehow, how to handle this jealousy and envy every day, it's like a torture. Uh, even I do good and they label workaholism or workaholic or if I am good they will label something and uh, purposely they will tell me don't sit extra work, they will ask us to sit for extra time and things like that every single day and uh, I really want some uh, advice to how to handle and I go down to their level also and so many things whatever you are uh, you explain today how to be compassionate and all those I try nothing is working out even though I'm promoted they want they want me to be like them I mean do their work they did to the point that they complained about me that I'm bossing around which was not true manager himself told that I'm not doing it yet they gave the assistant work and they took my work and they are doing it is like I'm asking God, what is this happening? Even though I'm trying to follow you, I'm promoted by you. And that work is taken away from me. How, how can the devil do this with these people? And now the constant torturing of uh, you know, jealousy and envy. Uh, where, how to uh, put a full stop for this? I just want some advice. Thank you. When it's jealousy, it's pointed at me, so. <laughs> right, sister. See, that, that usually happens in a workplace. I mean, very often, see, when we get promoted and we know it's by the grace of God, also be ready to receive a fair portion of resistance along with it. It comes with that package. Whenever you're recognized, whenever you're elevated in the midst of your colleagues with whom you've been working for so many years and they are actually your peers, and you've been recognized out of them probably because of the good work, because of the integrity and so many good qualities that you were able to display because of your faith in Christ. You've been recognized and you received it. Glory to God for that. But remember the rest of them probably don't look at you that way. And we need to understand that. Look at them from their point of view. And then you will see the difference. See, you, you, we need to accept the fact that they need not accept me or you as a person that deserves the elevation, they will always look at us as a person who didn't deserve it because they didn't get it, not because they have something against you. Because they would always tend to compare themselves, why did they not get it and why you? A simple question uh, to answer that is like, in this room, if pastor is going to give an open declaration that I want one of you to be a leader and I'm going to give you a responsibility, none of us would love to be. But if the same pastor says, like, I mean, if you can quickly choose a leader within the next five minutes and I'm going to give you a free trip to the U.S. for the chosen leader, everybody wants to be. That's the difference in the workplace also, sister. Like, it's, it's that everybody wants that promotion, but you got it. So now the role that you need to play back is, see, God has given this position to you. Now, the, the cup in your hand is that you actually become a facilitator to them. You know that they are against you, but then take on that servant leadership right now. This is the golden moment for you to show servant leadership. You will be accused. They will be talking behind your back. For all you know, I can guarantee you that when you're here in this room today, they are busy talking about you there. I guarantee you that will happen because your presence is not there. This is the best opportunity for them. In such situations, what you need to do is, when you get back to your workplace next, be there and let them see you to be a person with a difference. It's not a defeat. It's something that you need to do to come down to them, that they, which they did not expect from you. They only expect you to be defending your role, your promotion, and telling that, okay, I got it because I deserved it, and I'm here, I got the right thing, and you guys are against me. Now, right now, what you got to do is, thank you for enabling me to get this promotion. You tell yourself that, that it is because of them that I got it. And you be a person who will actually extend the gratitude back to them, irrespective of what they are throwing at you. I mean, that is the Christ-like attitude. I mean, very, very, very beautiful example is Christ on the cross. They said, if you are the king of the Jews, come down. I mean, nobody wanted to help him there, right? But he said, Father, forgive them. Put on the same attitude to the sister. Like when you are the target, that's the golden opportunity for you to actually serve them. Servant leadership comes from a point at which you are helpless. 
servant leader actually starts off from a point at which you are the target servant leader actually starts off from a point at which nobody wants you from there is the point from which for you can actually start it's very easy on a platter to say like i i i will be a person with a servant leadership and everybody is nice to me that's not servant leadership servant leader comes in at a place when everybody in the organization is against you what did the lord jesus say in the book of matthew you very clearly in my name everyone will hate you and if that's happening to you just put it at the feet of the lord and say god from tomorrow when i get back to my workplace i know that all of them are against me blaming me even removing the responsibility that i should be doing but father by your grace i'm going to walk back shamelessly into that office and i'm going to talk to them like as if nothing happened and so when you when you talk to them that way you know what you're doing is they are going to feel oh she's such a nice person who deserves this position and you will win them over through the grace of god you cannot win them over through your intellectual or whatever experience we have it cannot happen it can only happen by the intervention of grace of god through your experience and the person that you are in that organization and you will see that over a period of time they will actually be your supporters and they will become the reason for further promotions in your life and they will support you to the hilt the only thing is to be that servant leader who can actually be available to them in spite of the brick bats thrown at you not easy but definitely possible god bless you then okay we are actually out of time is it anybody with a pressing question okay none i'm going to just quickly uh ask two questions just so that we have covered ground one for ratna and one for pastor so ratna how do i seek to maintain peace between colleagues when i feel one of them is being targeted so how do i do that in a god honoring way sorry karuna can you repeat the question how do i seek to maintain peace between colleagues when i feel one of them is being targeted okay see i think uh one of the thing i mean you see in office it's somebody or the other is always targeted by some group or the other right this happens all over the office i think as a as a christian right as a believer in christ one of the thing what we need to do is that you know how can we really uh bring peace into every situation in any conflict so normally conflicts are between two parties or two people or two teams or two groups or two locations or whatever i think it's very very important you know to start building you know things which can actually build trust right because the conflict is there because there is no trust now they also uh, you know to build trust sometimes it takes time right i mean they always say that trust is built you know with tears of you know with droplets but then you know it can also be broken in buckets right so it's like like it can be lost over one minute for something but then it you know it takes a lot of time to build so i think as a as a christian you know like what pastor also shared in the mo- in, in the in the morning you know how can you really be the salt and light in that situation right i mean there are times that you can you can do certain actions there are sometimes you can even just keep quiet and that can actually bring healing in that conflicting situation so it's always also important to ask god you know for wisdom um many a times like i said you know we we ask we ask god when there is a healing when there is a uh, you know important decision to be made in our life but for workplace conflict every day what we face it is very very essential to take it to the lord and i'm sure the holy spirit of god will give us you know the wisdom and to deal with that conflict or you know even if someone is targeted you could actually be the source of comfort for both the parties which can actually bring healing to you know that people who are in the conflict thank you pastor so the last question how does one i'm going to club couple of questions together how does one manage a work life balance when we have personal problems family problems unable to focus on work how does you how do you, how does one manage it and how do you maintain a healthy balance between work goals and personal goals okay that's a lot of questions <laughs> um uh, i'll try to I'll try to give an answer um, that's pretty that kind of tries to cover these things um one of the things is to have your own um uh, uh personal life plan um so one of the things i'd encourage you to do is 
to have a plan for your life. Now, you know, whether you agree with planning or not, that's a separate session. <laughs> we'll talk about it. But here's what I try to do is uh, I have a life plan that looks over the next decade. Uh, so I have a sense of where should I be going over the next 10 years. Um, and then we, we do it, of course, with the help of the Holy Spirit, right? So we think, we, we, we understand uh, the three things, the three things that motivate us, right? What are the talents? Um, what, is the, what are your passions? And what is your mission? So you align your talents with the gifts that God has given you. Uh, you align your passion, what do you really like to do, and your mission. What do you really want to accomplish? What do you feel God's, God's assignment on your life is? Or what, is what, what are you living for, right? So you align your talent, passion, and mission. And that kind of gives you a sense of direction for your life. And then as you listen to the Lord, you have a life plan. So you're planning for the next 10 years. And I do it in a sim simple Excel sheet. So you could use an Excel sheet or something. You write it down. Now, then, so that's, so you're living life with purpose. So what happens in the workplace, hopefully, is helping fulfill these three things. Your talents, or you can use the word skills or capabilities, your talents, passion, and mission. What's happening in the workplace? And it's connected to your life plan, which is connected to God's assignment for your life. The second thing is, have a plan for every year, right? So now, usually, towards the end of the year, I plan for the next year. So we do that for the church and the ministry, but also do something for your personal life. So you plan that you're going to take two, two, two vacations with your family. So let's say, you know, when, when our kids were growing up, uh, it would usually be during you know, May, June, and then there will be another vacation in October or whatever, those, those holidays. So you already blocked those two weeks of vacation time, right? So, and so you've done your plan for the year. You've put your family in the calendar even before anything from the work can come in and take up that space. So you, you've planned to keep things in order. You've already planned to keep things in balance, Right? So you, you, you already plan that you're going to spend time with your family. And then you work down to your weekly plan. So every week, you plan to spend time with your family. Right? Because if you don't plan it, you won't spend time. And then four weeks will go and your wife will say, Hey, when was the last time we had dinner together? You know? It's like, when did that happen? You can't even remember. Right? Because you don't plan. So... You plan. Uh, you have a routine, right? So you may, on a, on a weekly basis, you're planning time with your children, right? Uh, maybe it's a Saturday evening. Maybe it's a Sunday evening. Whatever works in, in your schedule, you're putting that time in on a weekly basis, saying, I am going to spend time with my children, you know, Saturday morning, Saturday evenings, whatever works for you. You put it into your weekly plan. And for that, I use Outlook, I block out, you know, I mean, now kids are grown, so the, my plan's a little different, but when kids were there at home, that was what it was. Every Saturday morning was block, blocked for the children. Uh, nothing else, nothing would take that spot there. It's already there in my calendars. For the whole year, it's blocked. Every week, that's the time. Uh, you plan out time, you know, you plan to have your dinner with your family, or whatever works for you, your breakfast, or your dinner, your lunch, I mean, maybe lunch, we're all at work, but... You plan to have your dinner with your family. So that's the time you all sit together and have dinner. And then you plan to have you know, a time of prayer after your dinner. You're all going to sit together for the next half an hour. You're going to talk. You're going to have some family time. You're going to pray together. So how can you balance it? The only way is you plan to balance it. If you don't plan to balance it, your life will be out of balance because everything is happening ad hoc. Everything is happening at random and there is no sense of direction, right? So to put it in a nutshell, have a life plan, have an annual plan, have a weekly plan. Factor in time for your family into all of that. And that's the only way, work has its time, but your family has already been put into your calendar, it's there, you will make sure you spend time with that. Then, of course, there is fluidity in the sense that if you have to travel on work, Obviously, you know, 
when you're away from home, those are days you won't be there with your family, but then you need to make sure you balance that out as soon as you get back, you spend extra time with family, get, you know, uh, all of that. So you, those checks and balances you have, and you can restore it. Now, if there are times when things go really bad at home in family, here's the most important thing. You can always earn money, but you can never get time you can never earn back time with your family. Time gone is gone forever. You can always earn money. You can get a better job. You can look for a better job. But your children are going to be there at home for only such amount of time. Then they're gone. You can never get that back. I mean, they will be adults. And of course, you relate to them as adults. And they have their own families and so on. That's a different thing. So if there is problem in your family, Whatever you can, do it in order to prioritize taking care of that problem, in order to take care of the situation at home. If it means taking time away from work, you know, of course you, you, know, you co coordinate with people at work, take time off, focus on the family. If it means taking a month unpaid leave, do it. Right? Because the time with the family is time you'll never get back. And if there is a problem, you have to address it. Because if we don't address it, it's only going to get worse. And it's just going to keep on, you know, it's just, just going, to, uh, it's going to be sometimes self-destructive. Sometimes things will implode. Uh, so you better take time to do it. And I would say, you know, the time that you may take off from work to focus on the family is, is something that's worth it. So we should do it. I hope I answered your question. All three were answered. Thank you, Pastor. So thank you once again. We have run out of time. I do have a lot of questions. If any questions weren't answered, we're going to share our email ID. Feel free to email us, and we will personally respond. But thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Ratna. Thank you, Mr. Ibrahim. Thank you so much.